Chapter 3 Chief Engineer O'Brien tugged the shirt of his uniform as he hurried to Ops. A man needed rest every now and then. Was it his fault that Keiko had come to their quarters at the same time? He hadn't seen his wife in almost two days since their rotations didn't match, and Molly was off at her friend's for the afternoon. He had taken off his communications badge and set it on a chair in the bathroom with the rest of his clothes. Not a crime, really. After all, he was supposed to have 24 hours off. And of course he hadn't noticed the flickering lights. No lights had been on in their quarters. Kira had no right to be angry with him. He had been on his own time. The unpainted girders in the corridor looked strange in the thin light. His ears still rang from the alarms and Kira's curt scolding. He was not at her beck and call. He would tell her that if she gave him a hard time in ops. He would have enough to deal with, judging by that last power outage. It had caught him just outside his quarters. In the darkness and in his sleepy state, he had gotten confused for a moment and thought he was in a corridor in the Enterprise. No such luck. The Enterprise, at its worst, never achieved the level of engineering disaster O'Brien dealt with each day in the Deep Space Nine. And judging from Kira's tone, that level of disaster had suddenly grown measurably worse. Outside the turbo lift, a Ferengi and a humanoid escorted an ancient Ferengi down the corridor. The Nagus. As if the engineering problems weren't enough. O'Brien nodded at them, trying not to stare at the fine white hairs growing out of the Nagus's oversized ears. The Ferengi made him nervous. Their unabashed avarice made him feel as if they ran naked in public. Such blatant emotion grated against his own conservative upbringing. The turbo lift had the dry, almost mothball-like scent that Ferengi seemed to prefer, mixed with the smell of burnt wiring and a rising heat, which could only mean that the environmental controls were down again. O'Brien didn't really want to get on, but he did. He hoped by the time the lift reached Ops, the headache threatening behind his eyes would disappear. As he expected, Ops was a mess. A thin haze of smoke filled the room, filtering everything through a gray gauze. Most of the smoke gathered at the top of Ops, near the portals, blocking O'Brien's favorite view. The burnt electrical smell was stronger here, and some wires still sparked near the transporter unit behind his desk. Everything was dark in Cisco's office, something that should never happen. Lights blinked on every visible panel. Cisco manned one station while Dax huddled over the science console. Cisco glanced up and nodded, not saying a word as O'Brien scrambled to his engineering station. Kira stood up from behind the station. When she saw O'Brien, her brown eyes narrowed. We could have used you earlier, mister. Half a dozen more lights lit up on his board as he stood there. He didn't have time to make excuses or to fight with the Major. He stepped in front of her and bent over his console. Most of the Major systems, including all power and life support, were running for the moment, but it was going to take him most of the day to recalibrate some of the smaller systems and processors. Nothing that couldn't wait until he figured out what had caused all this in the first place. I've got what is left of the Ferengi ship, Dax said, as if she were continuing a conversation. The sound of her low, calm voice made him realize how silent Ops really was. It's in a safe orbit away from the station. It will hold there for salvage. Ferengi ship? A lot had happened since he went to his quarters. The Ferengi caused this, O'Brien asked. Sisko did not look up. Whatever bounced us around destroyed their ship. We tried to grab it, but the tractor beam cut out. One more problem, but a bit of relief as well. The in-station malfunctions happened because of an outside event. O'Brien had been afraid that with the Cardassian systems and his jury rigging, some important connector he didn't even know about had blown. You don't know what happened? O'Brien asked. No, Kira snapped. She was at another station, paging for more help on the bridge. But whatever hit us had to be big. A wide area was affected. Any idea how wide? Maybe if he knew the source, it would help him determine the quickest way to solve the problems. We have had reports from as far away as Bajor, Dax said. Any fixes to location, or source, O'Brien asked. Dax shook her head. At this point, I don't even know what hit us. Well, O'Brien said, perhaps the damage will give us a clue. We can eliminate a number of possibilities just by looking at the destruction pattern. Do it, Sisko said. We need to have systems up and running first, Kira said. 
O'Brien would never get used to the blunt rudeness of Bajoran women. He had often wondered why Sisko, a Starfleet commander, had not insisted that she use more formal address. Well then, Major, Sisko said, humor lacing his deep voice, I guess you'll have to investigate the damage yourself. O'Brien suppressed a smile as he told the computer to trace system malfunctions and separate out the work assignments. If he could pass the easy stuff to some of his support staff, he could worry about the larger problems, like the tractor beam. He rubbed his forehead. The smoke was making that headache worse, and a tickle grew in the back of his throat. Maybe he should work on the replicators first. He needed coffee. Call coming in from the Cardassians, Kira said. The hair on the back of O'Brien's neck tingled. Cardassians? Would they know a way to disable the station without being traced? He punched in three diagnostic programs with that scenario in mind. Put them on the main view screen, Sisko said. He stood and walked to the operations table. A Cardassian face O'Brien had never seen before dominated the main view screen. The Cardassian's ridges and lines, wide eyes and downturned mouth made O'Brien very, very uneasy. I am Commander Benjamin Sisko, Captain. Sisko's voice had grown deeper, more authoritative. I run Deep Space Nine. I am familiar with you, Sisko. The captain did not introduce himself. I want to know if your assault on our ships was intentional. I can assure you that we had nothing to do with any attack on your ships. Check your sensors and you'll see that the interruption happened in a wide section of space near the wormhole. We were affected as well. We read no significant damage to your station, Commander, the Cardassian said. We, on the other hand, have had two ships knocked offline and a power core disruption in another. All evidence points to a subspace distortion that came from this system. Explain this. I wish we could, Sisko said. We lost lights and power a few moments ago. The Cardassian pushed his face closer to the screen. We have kept our agreement with the Federation, despite incursions by Bajoran terrorists and the increased activity caused by the wormhole. The agreement is no longer binding when you attack our fleet. O'Brien gripped the edge of the console. The Cardassians could get ugly when they were angry. Sisko put his hands behind his back and took a deep breath. We did not attack your fleet. Something affected us both. We are doing what we can to discover the cause. The Cardassian's smile did not reach his eyes. Do that, Commander, and I hope your explanation is a good one. But let me warn you, if these attacks continue, it will be perceived as an act of war. The view screen went blank. Sisko frowned. He turned to Dax. The affected area must have been larger than we suspected. His calmness surprised O'Brien. But then Sisko had never experienced the full wrath of the Cardassians. O'Brien studied the board in front of him. The diagnostics had shown no evidence of Cardassian attack. In fact, the first diagnostic found no cause at all. The lights flickered. O'Brien did not glance up. Maybe if he ignored the lights, the problems would go away. The second diagnostic he ran showed that all the replicators were offline, as well as the environmental controls in Ops, the Promenade, and most of the docking ring. Benjamin, Dax said, I am getting a strange subspace surge. I can't seem to pinpoint it, but... She stopped talking for a moment as her fingers flew over the board in front of her. The sensors have gone dead. O'Brien, Sisko said. The headache had spread in a tight band around his skull. A hundred warning lights flared into being. The diagnostics stopped as the system overloaded. Everything was just going wrong at once, again. The lights flickered. Then the station rocked as another wave hit it, and the inertial dampers cut out for a moment. In his bed, the wave had felt like an earthquake, but here it felt as if a giant had grabbed the station and shook it in his overlarge hands. O'Brien clung to the engineering console and kept an eye on the sparking connectors near the transporter. When the rocking stopped, he rerouted power from some backup systems in time to stop another total blackout. A bit more rerouting, and some of the warning lights went out except one very important one. The station's power core containment had been slightly damaged. He did a quick run-through of the core systems, checking every detail until he was satisfied everything was fine. Ops was stifling hot. 
and the tickle in his throat had grown worse. He permitted himself a small cough before turning to Dax. Sensors back up. Dax nodded. They lost the transporters and half the station's turbo lifts on that one, O'Brien said. And there was slight damage to power core containment. I have that under control. Cisco nodded. Start with the turbo lifts and get everything back up as soon as you can. Dax, can you tell how widespread that one was? There is nothing to measure, Benjamin. Another message coming in from the Cardassians, Kira said. They don't sound happy. No one was happy, O'Brien least of all. If the Cardassians got hit again, O'Brien said, we're dealing with something really big. And not very discriminating. After the turbo lifts, he would work on the replicators. He had a hunch coffee would grow in importance as the hours wore on. Chapter 4 The flickering lights reminded Odo, Chief of Station Security, of the last days of the Cardassian reign. While the station rumbled and shook, he sat on his chair, letting it bounce around while he maintained his dignity. Lieutenant George Primmon, Starfleet Security, who was sitting across from him, had gone pale in that delightfully unconscious way humans had of showing fear. Primmon wasn't as tough as he thought he was. He had actually stifled a cry when the lights went out this last time. Odo sighed with impatience. In his hand, he held a printout of a communique from Starfleet. The communique had come to Primmon, and Odo had noted, even before the lights went out, that it was incomplete. Now that the lights had returned, he scanned the document. It said nothing of any use. He waited until the alarm sirens went off before continuing the conversation. He could have spoken over the noise, but no sense straining himself. Besides, he didn't want to put Primmon at ease. So, Odo said as if the conversation had never stopped. Who is this, the Thwan? Primmon's Adam's apple bobbed as he swallowed. He ran his palms over the legs of his uniform, as if he were trying to put himself back together. Don't you want to check with Cisco and see what the problem is? If it concerned me, he would have contacted me, Odo said. Obviously, the problem is technical, and that falls into Chief O'Brien's area. Odo leaned forward and put his elbows on his desk. You were going to tell me about Lestuan. Primmon shot a nervous glance at the door. Through it, Odo could see people in the promenade hurrying to get out of the public areas before the station's lights went down again. Lestuan, Primmon said, as if he had already forgotten. His Adam's apple bobbed again. The man was not only officious, he was afraid of the dark. Primmon took a deep breath. I have never dealt with the man personally. He is a compulsive gambler, and unlike most, he's excellent at it. He also kills. He started out in the Vuksevich sector, where gossip attributes 15 deaths to his hand. He's also wanted for murder in the Hoffman colonies. Ultion IV has a warrant out for him. Seems he murdered an entire family just after supper, and the Ultonians want to execute him for it. He was caught red-handed in the Patterson belt, murdering a companion over a game of cards. Four guards showed up, and Lestuan killed them too. Only the last one lived long enough to send a communique to the district commander. Unfortunately, no one ever got a complete description of Lestuan, and he has always managed to achieve a quick escape. Starfleet considers him dangerous. Obviously, Odo said, or they wouldn't have sent you to protect us. I am not here to protect... Primmon stopped himself and jutted out his chin, realizing a beat too late that Odo was being sarcastic. I served many years on starships. Problems like these often lead to bigger things. So instead you moved into a comfortable job and spend your time harassing me. Look, Constable, the Federation wants Lestuan. He's dangerous. Even the communique says that, Odo said, the sarcasm making his words sound flat. And Starfleet doesn't need any problems from you. No, Odo said. You need my help. You complain about my efficiency, and you give me nothing to work with. A communique, a name, personality traits that could describe half the customers at Quark's. If you give me something to work with, then maybe I will give you results. We know he's here. Do you? The communique says nothing about that. Primmon shrugged. 
The Federation would not have sent me to you without a reason. Of course they would, Odo said. Trimmon's face lost its paleness. A bright red flush was working its way up his neck to his chin. Odo loved that flush. It was visible proof that he angered Primen as much as Primen angered him. I'll get his record sent from the Federation. Good, Odo said. By the time it arrives, the Thwan will have left. The flush had made its way to Primen's eyebrows. He stood. I would check Quarks if I were you. If the Thwan is on the station, he will be there. Brilliant, Odo said. You want me to search for a man I don't know who could be using a different name, who is human or humanoid, and a gambler. Do you suggest I arrest half of the clientele? I suggest you interview Quark. Quark may know him. The flush had reached the roots of Primmon's hair. Indeed, Odo said. And Quark will turn one of his paying customers over to me. It astounds me how little you know of the Ferengi mind. Odo? Primmon's voice raised a notch. Odo stood. I will go to Quark's because I planned to go there anyway. Have you noticed how few people are in the promenade? Primen glanced out through the door's glass. He shrugged. With all the technical problems, they're probably staying on their ships or in their quarters. It makes sense to me. His tone implied that he would like to be off the station too. Odo nodded. Of course, Primen didn't notice the real problem. People like Primen never did. Instead, he wanted Odo to search for a murderous gambler at Quark's, which was something like searching for a scout ship in the wormhole. One was always easy to find, but not the right one. Odo shoved past Primen and opened the door for him. Primen paused in front of him. Why did you ask me that? Odo stared at him, wondering how the man had ever worked in security. Because the docking rings are nearly full. Most of the ships have arrived in the last 24 hours. Crews usually shop in the promenade. When there are that many ships, the station is crowded. It's not. You think that's significant? I'm going to find out, Odo said. He escorted Primen out the door, which closed behind them. Primen headed toward his quarters. Odo turned toward Quark's. He had checked the duty rosters on all the ships that had docked and found that most had given their crews shore leave on Bajor. The makeup of the crews seemed odd to him as well. Most of them had little or no experience, while others were known for their smuggling and nefarious dealings. When Primen had said the word gambler, Odo had been way ahead of him. But Odo had seen nothing unusual at Quark's. If anything, the number of players at the Dabo tables had been down the last few nights. Still, an uneasy feeling had grown in Odo's stomach, and that uneasy feeling usually meant Quark was up to something. As he approached Quark's, he stopped. No noise, no laughter, no shouts of Dabo. True, the problems at the station might have affected the clientele, as Primen suggested, but it never had before. Everyone played at Quark's whether there was a problem or not. Two Bajoran men argued quietly at a table in the center of the bar. The Dabo girl leaned on the Dabo table, holding her stick and moving the pieces herself. She smiled when she saw Odo, then the smile faded when she realized who he was. The bar smelled faintly of wet dog, and the climate controls were out. The heat was enough to drive anyone away, apparently even Quark, who, contrary to his norm, was nowhere to be found. Neither was wrong. Quark never left the bar unattended. Odo scanned the upper tables. Not even Nog showed his young Ferengi face. Is your boss here? Odo asked the Dabo girl. She glanced at the door leading into the back room, then at the table, her gaze never touching Odo. No, she said. He left me in charge. Very strange. Quark wouldn't trust the profits of his bar to anyone, let alone a non-Ferengi, which meant that the profits were being made elsewhere. The back room? Quark used it for special games, private playing sessions, and occasional auctions. You're in charge. Odo said. The Davo girl nodded. In charge of sending clients into that back room? Again, that quick glance. She turned the Davo stick over in her fingers. No, she said quietly. I can use the replicator just as well as anyone else. 
I bet you can, Odo said. He pushed past her and strode across the room to the big door that led into the back room. The Dabo girl touched his arm, but he shook her off. The door hissed open, revealing ten tables covered with green felt, about twenty clients, human, alien, and Ferengi, and Quark, his body half hidden under the weight of a Romulan woman. Her hair brushed the floor, her hands and feet dragged on it, and her green blood covered half of Quark's shirt. She had to be dead. No living woman, let alone a Romulan, would let Quark touch her like that. What have we here? Odo asked. Quark peeked from under the Romulan's armpit, took a deep breath of air and seemed to hold it. I can explain, he said. I certainly hope so, Odo replied. Chapter 5 the station's power outages had taken the environmental controls offline. Dr. Julian Bashir pushed his shirt sleeves over his elbows. He had created a stasis field over the body of the dead Romulan woman, but once that was broken, he would have only a few minutes to conduct the autopsy. The heat would begin the process of decay even quicker, and that much blood would attract some of the more interesting staph infections onto the body's surface. To make matters worse, Odo and Primen, the Starfleet security officer, were hovering over the body, as if it were a prize to be given to the best detective. Bashir wiped his forehead, then went to the counter and sterilized his hands. I don't want either of you close to that body, he said. We'll have enough troubles as it is. Both men backed up. No matter what they thought of Bashir outside of the infirmary, inside, he was God. He was about to remove the stasis field when the door hissed open. I told you to run the sterilization program in the other room, he snapped without looking up. New assistants often had to hear instructions twice before completing them. Then I didn't hear you correctly, doctor. The answering voice was deep and warm, with a trace of humor. Bashir felt a heat that had nothing to do with the environmental controls run through his body. He whirled. Commander Benjamin Sisko stood at the door, hands clasped behind his back, his normally trim uniform marred with smoke stains on one sleeve. Commander, I didn't realize. I know, Sisko said with a smile. Then he approached the body and frowned. Have you found anything? I need to do a blood and urine analysis and a DNA scan, Bashir said, but I can already tell you that the cause of death is exactly what it appears to be. Five stab wounds. Three to the stomach, one to the left lung. The fifth wound killed her. It punctured the heart. Then what are you completing the other scans for? Sisko asked. There was a bit of material on the knife that I didn't recognize, Bashir said. I'll do a poison analysis as well as a fiber trace. The knife had no prints. It was a Ferengi knife, the kind they used for some of their more grotesque cold dishes. Sisko looked at the body. Bashir followed his gaze, trying to see with Sisko's eyes. The woman was now nude. The stab wounds had discolored her greenish-tinted skin, leaving large bruised areas along her torso. Her eyes were still open, haunted, empty. Her black hair was swept back, revealing swooping eyebrows and small pointed ears. She had had a kind of beauty. Who did this? Sisko asked. When no one responded, he turned his head slightly toward Odo. Why did someone die on my station? Bashir moved to the other side of the body and removed the stasis field. He wanted to be as far from Sisko as possible. Something in Sisko's voice let Bashir know that the commander would not tolerate any uncertainties. It seems our dear friend Quark has decided to hold a poker tournament, Odo said and has invited every undesirable he can find from inside and outside the Federation. Actually, sir, Primen said, we have a suspect. His name is Lestuan. Starfleet sent us a communique telling us to watch for him. He is a noted gambler and murderer, wanted on Starbase 5 for... If we have a suspect, Sisko said, why isn't he in custody? The metallic odor of blood rose from the body so strongly that Bashir had to step back. He programmed the computer to run a scan while he removed blood traces for later examination. Even though he was working, he was listening. What Mr. Primen didn't tell you, Commander, Odo said, his voice even flatter than usual, 
is that Starfleet's communique is extremely vague. They warn us about the Thwan, but do not tell us his age, race, or appearance. They don't even know for sure if he will be on Deep Space Nine. Mr. Primen has assumed... I don't want assumptions, Sisko snapped. I want answers. Here is what we know so far, Odo said. The door to Quark's back room was closed just before the big power outage. The computer tells us that the door opened and closed once in the darkness, and that no one beamed in. I have run a preliminary DNA trace and fiber scan, matching the information against the 30 people in the room, and have found nothing unusual. But I am sure that someone in that room killed her. Wonderful. One chance in 30 of catching a killer. Sisko stood over the body. He was staring at Bashir's hands. Bashir tried not to look up. He didn't want his hands to shake. I want no ship to leave this station until the murderer is caught. Close down Quark's poker game and let me know as soon as you have something. Bashir finished running the diagnostics. He reinstated the stasis field until they could put the body into cold storage. Do you really think shutting down the game is such a good idea, he asked. After all, the murderer came here to play poker. The doctor has a point, Odo said. I would love to shut down Quark's little game, but I think we have a better chance of catching the killer if the game goes on. Do you have a plan, Odo? Sisko asked. With all due respect, sir, Primen imposed his small frame between Sisko and Odo. If the game continues, the killer might kill again. I think any plan the constable has will be a poor one. The killer will not kill again, Odo said, because I will have joined the game. Bashir frowned. He crossed his arms in front of his chest. I didn't know you gambled. I don't, Odo said, but I am willing to do what I must to catch a killer. Sir, Primen leaned against the autopsy table. Bashir tapped his shoulder and moved him away. Primen grimaced at him. Bashir resisted the urge to grimace back. The man was difficult, but making faces at him would not impress the commander. I would like to advise against this action. Mr. Primen, Sisko said, his voice firm. We have had this discussion before. Odo is highly qualified to do his job. If he believes that his plan will flush our killer, then I believe it will as well. Sisko stepped around Primen so that Primen was excluded from the conversation. Odo, will Quark let you into the tournament? I can handle Quark, Odo said. Sisko nodded. I believe you can. Bashir moved away from the table. He envied Odo, spending his time at the poker game, even with a killer on the loose. This was the kind of frontier that Bashir had imagined. He had begged Quark to let him into the game, but Quark had repeatedly said no. He believed that Bashir wouldn't be able to hold his own. But Bashir had always done well in late-night games in the Academy Medical School, and knew he would be able to now. Dr. Bashir, Sisko said, if you find anything unusual in the remaining lab work, notify me immediately. The commander's curt tones snapped Bashir from his reverie. Yes, sir, he said. Sisko glanced at the Romulan woman on the table, and then back at Odo. Find whoever did this. Odo nodded. I will. That you can count on. The lights flickered. The stasis field fluctuated and disappeared. Bashir hurried back to the table to re-establish the field. Sisko glanced up at the overhead light and then back at Odo. Good, he said. At the moment we need something around here we can count on. Chapter 6 Odo loved to hear Quark whimper. And Quark had been doing just that for the past 15 minutes. The temperature in Odo's office had risen since the last power outage, and the sharp, fermented smell of Ferengi sweat filled the room. Beads of moisture dripped off Quark's brow ridges onto his nose. Some traveled around the rims of his oversized ears. Quark swatted at the drops, as if they were Bajoran lychee bugs. Odo stood over Quark, hoping to make the Ferengi even more nervous. Quark made mistakes when he was nervous. He kept glancing over his shoulder at the door. The promenade was still empty, and Quark's place was not visible from Odo's office. If you aren't going to ask questions, you should let me go, 
Quark said. The left side of his clothing was stained with the Romulan's blood. Oh, I plan to ask questions. Odo paused for maximum effect. He had avoided questioning Quark, hoping the tension would make Quark more talkative. Quark had hovered around Odo in the back room while they waited for Bashir to arrive. Once the doctor took the body away for autopsy, Odo had hurried Quark to his office, commanding him to stay or get charged with murder. Quark had stayed while Odo watched the autopsy and spoke with Commander Sisko. When Odo arrived, Quark was pacing. Small dusty footprints marred Odo's normally clean floor. Quark had apparently been pacing the entire time Odo was gone. Commander Sisko wants your game closed down, Odo said. What for? There was just a hint of panic in Quark's voice. Well, Odo said slowly, since it is the scene of a rather interesting murder, I believe he's afraid that another may occur. So until we catch the killer, I will have to shut down the bar. Quark stood. You can't do that. I need it open, at least the back room, by tomorrow morning. I'm sure that will be possible. Really? Odo smiled. What do you need the room for? Nothing, really. Just a few games. Nothing? Then you won't mind having the bar closed for, say, a week. A week! Quark stood. I can't have that! I am investigating a murder, Quark. You were found holding the body. I didn't kill anyone. So you say. The room was dark. Anyone could have come in or left. The computer records say that only Rom used the door. Are you saying Rom killed the woman? Yes. No. I am not saying anything. Quark slid his chair back, away from Odo. Except that you want to have the room available tomorrow morning. For a few games, Quark. Exactly what type of games? Quark shifted in his chair. A bead of sweat fell from his chin onto his shirt. Card games, he said. Nothing more than a few simple card games. Actually, poker. Don't withhold information from me, Quark, Odo said. He leaned toward Quark. You are holding a poker tournament and you expect to make a great deal of money doing so. But how did you... Quark let the question drop. You can't hide things from me in this station. It had been a fairly simple deduction. He had never seen so many formal-looking tables in Quark's back room. That, plus the information Odo had received on the visitor's landing at the station, combined with the news of Listhuan, made Quark's plan very clear. The handful of players Odo had spoken to after the murder had confirmed it. Quark was planning one of the biggest poker tournaments the Quadrant had ever seen. But Quark hadn't counted on Listhuan. Identifying him among all the players might take some effort. The tournament will be quite entertaining, Quark said. You should drop by and watch some of the action. Assuming, Odo said, that I allow the card tournament to go on. No, you couldn't. I've been planning this for years. Some of the best players in the sector are here. There is the little matter, Odo said, of the murder. I'm sure, Quark said, that with your great detective skills, you will soon have the guilty party in custody. I may already have the guilty party in custody. I did not kill her. No, Odo said. You merely moved her body. Quark looked down. I was bringing her to you. You were going to hide her until the tournament was over. It wouldn't have made any difference. Some days Odo wished that Quark had vanished with the Cardassians. If that had happened, Odo's job would have been a lot easier, if less interesting. Of course not, Odo said, letting the sarcasm control his tone. It would only give the murderer time to escape. He may already have done that. So you said. Odo leaned on his desk and crossed his arms in front of his chest. If you are as innocent as you claim, that means the murderer was in the room when the lights went out. People were using the door. Rom used the door, at your insistence. I got that much of the story from the handful of people I spoke with. 
I do not believe that someone would wait for accidental darkness, then slip into a room he had never seen before to murder a specific person. No, the murderer was there. Quark frowned. What's your point? My point is this, Odo said slowly. His skin tingled. He would enjoy Quark's response to this suggestion. When the tournament starts tomorrow morning, I need to have a seat at one of the tables. You can't play poker. You won't understand a thing. Quark stood as if that settled the matter. You have been encouraging me for a long time to learn to gamble, Odo said, walking to Quark's side and looking down on him. Quark's body trembled. The sweat dripped off his ears. You need 100 bars of gold-pressed latinum to enter. No, I don't, Odo said. He graced Quark with a rare half-smile. You need to make money off this game, and as host, you can't play yourself. The house take would never satisfy a Ferengi. Am I right, Quark? I will make a good profit on this game, Quark said. Yes. Odo blocked Quark's path to the door. The sharp fermented scent of Ferengi sweat had grown stronger. You will make a profit by putting your own players in the game. I suspect they will not always play by the rules. Everyone has to play by the rules. Odo tilted his head. Don't lie to me, Quark. I can shut your tournament down in an instant. Quark's chin jutted out. If I let you play, will you keep the bar open? Yes, Odo said. He resisted the urge to rub his hands together. Quark was finally beginning to understand. I only have room for 80 players, Quark said. And there was already someone waiting to take the dead woman's place. Get rid of one of your players, Odo said. I will take his place. You can't be a ringer if you can't play cards. You want to make a profit, Odo said. And I want to catch a murderer. It seems to me, Quark, you had better teach me how to play poker. By tomorrow morning? Unless you want to postpone your game. Quark gritted his teeth. You'd better be a quick learner, Constable, because if you aren't, those other players will eat you alive. I believe that's your problem, Odo said. Chapter 7 Jake Sisko tried to look relaxed as he walked through the promenade, but the emptiness of the promenade bothered him. So did Nog's insistence that everything would be all right. The last time Nog had told Jake that, Jake's father had grounded him for a week. Jake didn't want that to happen again. And it would if his father caught him. His father had clear rules. When there were problems in the station, Jake was supposed to return to their quarters. The flickering lights, the awful earthquake-like shaking, and the blackouts meant trouble. Jake had tried to stay in his quarters. He had contacted Nog and asked him to come over for some cake. But Nog didn't like cake. At least, not chocolate cake. He always complained that it didn't crunch, and that it had been dead far too long to taste good. Instead, Nog had suggested that Jake meet him in the promenade. Jake had said no, but when his father notified him that the problems would keep him away for hours, Jake got bored. He contacted Nog and asked what was happening in the promenade. Nog wouldn't say, but he had promised that it would be great. This time, Jake paused only for a moment. All he could do in his quarters would be to pace while he worried if his dad was all right. Being busy was better. Nog moved with a typical Ferengi scuttle that somehow seemed faster than regular human pace. Jake had to hurry after him. He was afraid the lights would go out again and the smoke in the corridor made him uneasy. Nog, he said, I think maybe we should go to my quarters. I have an old-fashioned chess set that my father brought from Earth. Flatboard? Nog asked. Jake nodded. He had been waiting to try it since he had first seen it. No challenge in it. And besides, you won't bet. You don't bet on chess. My father does, Nog said. Jake sighed. Nog's father bet on everything. Nog didn't seem to understand games played without wagers. Where are we going? Just wait. You'll love it. Nog had said that about sautéed grub beetles, too. Jake couldn't eat food that still moved. 
Still, he followed Nog toward Quark's. They took the stairs leading to the second level of the promenade. Their boots rang against the metal. The sound sent a shiver down Jake's back. Usually the promenade was so noisy that he couldn't hear himself think, let alone walk. When they reached the top, Nog led him to the solid glass wall that looked down into Quark's. No one sat in the bar. The Dabo girl leaned over her table, looking bored. No one's in there, Jake said. I think we should go to my quarters. But Nog wasn't paying attention. He was using a small laser driver to take off a panel on the wall. Quietly, he set the panel on the floor, then looked around. Jake looked, too. They were alone. Nog crawled into the hole. Come on, he said, his voice echoing. Jake's heart pounded in his throat. His father had better be busy in ops. Jake could get grounded for more than a week for this. His dad had given him strict instructions to stay out of the service areas of the station. They were just too dangerous. But it seemed that standing out in the hall arguing with Nog would cause more problems, so he ducked inside. The service walkway was hot and lit with tiny lights on each side of the flooring. Probably emergency lighting. If everything shut off now, he and Nog would be in deep trouble. Nog reached around him and refastened the panel. This better be worth it, Jake said. Nog raised a finger to his lips. It is, he whispered. A bead of sweat ran down Jake's face. The service walkway they crouched on extended toward Quark's. When it reached the bar, it became a catwalk, supported by cables. It did look interesting. Where does this go? Hollow suites on both sides, Nog said, pointing. Follow me. Jake stared at the wall where the suites were. He really didn't want to see what happened in those suites. His dad had explained the facts of life to him years ago, but what his dad described and what happened in the hollow suites didn't sound like the same thing at all. Just the thought of some of the stuff he had heard made his stomach twist. Bent over in almost an ape-like crouch, Nog led the way down the service walkway between huge cables, blank walls, and support beams. Jake followed, his damp palms sliding on the metal. Something pierced his thumb and he stifled a cry. Nog looked up at him with a frown and put a finger to his lips again. Jake paused, wiped his hands on his pants, and continued his descent. Suddenly, Nog turned to the right and followed an even thinner path over what looked to be the ceiling of a room. Jake could hear talking and laughing from below. Really matter, a male voice said. Just gets rid of some of the competition. Well, a woman replied, I'm not sure I want to play with the kind of riffraff who believe in killing the opponent. Never played poker, have you, lady? The voices made Jake freeze. They had a harsh sound that he didn't like. Nog stopped and pointed. At first, Jake couldn't figure out what it was he was supposed to see. Ceiling tiles, support joists, and the backs of light fixtures stuck through the tiles. He inched closer. The voices became a blur. I saw my dad and Quark in here last week, Nog whispered. They were laughing about how much this would make them when the tournament started. End of Side One